And we're live from the res. Special guest here, Miss Claudette White. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. Well, I'm glad that you're here. I know you're always such a busy person, flying around throughout the bird world, the native world, doing all the do. Um, I know recently you've been on like kind of speaking series almost a little bit yeah, um, yeah. with the film that you were a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the name of that film again? The film is Tribal Justice. There you go. Tribal Justice. And what was that film about? It's a documentary really... I guess um, trying to portray what happens in tribal courts Okay. here in the state of California um, features myself and Judge Abby Avenatti from the Yurok tribe. Nice. And so we uh, participated in the film. It's not our film. We're like protagonists in it mm -hmm. and uh, just features our work and kind of some of the concepts we're using in tribal courts. And it was done predominantly for educational purposes, but it's um, really taken a lot of different directions. Nice. I know like for me, um, when I when I saw that film, I was like, that's cool because, you know, maybe I'm, I'm unique in this, but I feel like uh, I didn't know that there was a lot of um, natives involved in the legal system. You kind of hear like the old, um, you know, there's there's uh, stereotypes, but I, and sometimes perpetuated by our, our own people. But that us Indians are always in trouble. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like I think back to school and it's like you go to school when I was always in trouble or the, the natives are always in the trouble or fighting and messing around. And then and then you become adults and it's like, you know, some of the cousins kept that behavior going and wound up in trouble and whatnot. So to be on the other side, you know, of, of the legal system to, you know, to be in it and to be um, part of it, I think that's pretty powerful. So um, especially as like a woman to be doing that, you have uh, people coming up and, and telling you these kinds of things or? Um, yeah, I'm actually really surprised by it. I've had a really a lot of positive experiences from people mm -hmm. um, that will just acknowledge, you know, the fact that I'm a woman, that I'm doing the work. And one of the really big things that um, I think really moved, moved me in terms of encouraged me is um, people acknowledging that, you know, one, I'm tribal. Yeah. And I look like I'm tribal. Yeah. And that's not to be discriminatory against anybody that doesn't look tribal. Yeah. But for people that, you know, look like tribal people, it's uh, not something people see all the time. So when, I go to different reservations or have different speaking opportunities. People come to me like, man, it's so good, you know, to see somebody that looks like me, you know, doing what you do. And uh, that's always encouraging to see that. And uh, just recently um, here we had done a presentation at Squan and um, one of the former tribal leaders actually served this tribe for a long time had said uh, when he had met me there, can I take a picture with you? And I said, yeah, sure really didn't think much about it. I thought well, maybe it was because I was just sharing that night on sovereignty. And he said, uh, I think this is the first time I've seen a tribal judge that's tribal. Like truly tribal, right? In yeah. image and look. and Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. And that was a pretty big deal. I remember one of the first times uh, when I got on the bench, I was presenting at a California Indian Legal Services. Uh, annually, they were doing a tribal court symposium and uh, presented, didn't think too much about it. Uh, went to sit down and then uh, a couple elders came up to me and were talking to me, you know, chopping it up and they were teasing me and they said, wow, you know, you've done this, you've done that, you've been on your council, you manage your casino and like, now you're doing this, like, when did you start? When you were five? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I wish, <laughs> like, no, no, not at all. And uh, they told me they had some kids they wanted me to meet. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, sure. And, um, and I didn't know it until afterwards, they, you know, it was a good group of kids. And it uh, was an, another judge who was tribal from uh, Shingle Springs at the time. And uh, Judge Gomez, Judge Gomez told me later, did you realize that those people went home and gathered up a bunch of kids and brought them to come talk to you and wow. meet you? I was like, I mean, that really touched me, you know, not really yeah. thinking about what I do. Sometimes I just do it and not really realizing like the uh, impacts that can have on people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always encouraged. Like you know, there are a lot of people who will come up to me like crying, like elders, you know, like about how good it feels to see somebody like a woman doing the work and to be connected to tribes. So it's not something I take lightly. That's for sure. That's great. You know, I remember being a kid and, um, and I've shared the story a couple of times, but one of the elders here in this community is gone now, but he was on the uh, board of education here in Alpine. And I remember being a kid, they'd have assemblies and they'd call in the board, you know, and they'd come in and uh, do like student of the month and shake mm -hmm. hands and all that. But he always wore a ribbon shirt. I remember being a kid going like, wow, that's cool to see like, because I mean, the Alpine School District is it's predominantly European American. It's all a bunch of white kids and everything and, and you know, a handful of uh, minorities and a handful of natives. And so to see one of our own elders up there with a ribbon shirt on, I used to think, man, that guy's like representing hard. And this is like in the 80s, you know, um, but that was like before we had any kind of 
economic development that was really booming where mm -hmm. they were really wanting to hear anything from us. So for him to be in that space and uh, to just truly represent, you know, I imagine he must have gotten treated. Who knows how, you know, I'm sure they, they're probably looking at what he's wearing. Like, why are you wearing that? And they're all in suit and tie mm -hmm. and he's in a ribbon shirt. So I've always like teased council members, you know, because they're always in, uh, they always wear uh, suit and ties and stuff. But right. I always say like, well, you know, you're, you're native. You can get away with just throwing on the ribbon shirt, man. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to suit and tie if you don't want to. But, but, um, uh, you know, it's important to be in those spaces and to, and to occupy it, you know, in a native way, whatever mm -hmm. that way is. I think it's real powerful for the kids. So I do, uh, do you watch Judge Judy? I do. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite court TV show? Uh, probably Law and Order. Law and Order? Oh, okay. Yeah, I used to tease one of uh, my legal advisors in law school when day we were doing like this. Uh, it was a competition, a moot court competition, and we were having to do Void Deer where we picked juries, jury selection. And when they you go to school, in law school, they don't teach you how to be attorneys. They teach you basically how to research and oh. about types of laws and subject matters, but they don't teach you how to be an attorney or how to be a judge. And so, and... Um, I didn't have a clue, you know, how to do void deer. And he was like, well, you better figure it out quick because, you know, you're up next and you got to be pick your jury. And I told him, like, I didn't Oh, it was like that. the real deal time. You had to go out there and. Yeah, you know, well, it was for the competition. Over the competition. Oh, okay. Yeah. But okay. Even then he was like prepping yeah. us because he wanted us to do well. And I was like, yeah, I never seen this on Law and Order. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, please don't say that out loud. I am your yeah. advisor, you know, but. That's probably my favorite show. You're just waiting for the song to come on so exactly. you can start. That's actually my ringtone. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. So is there like a there's probably a lot of etiquette in the court? Is that is there like is that just like uh like you have to do those things or is that something that just kind of like goes with the territory? Is there room to kind of make your own etiquette protocols? There's definitely room to make your own etiquette, and it varies from tribe to tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, some tribes are their tribal courts are very westernized, like. Like you said, anything you'd see like in state court uh -huh. or anywhere else. And some tribes are a little bit more um, like more relaxed about what they do. And so you don't have to have all the pomp and circumstance and the etiquette or protocol. And uh, really, it's like I said, it's from tribe to tribe. And even in like when I was with Pucham, my own tribe, um, it would change. It changes mm -hmm. on depending on who's before me and what the issues are. If I got somebody who comes in... Um, you know, very formal and expecting like something that they'd see on, you know, Law and Order or Judge Judy, then that's my, that might be what they get, you know, or if I got somebody who comes in, um, who might be all rezzed out and just, you know, from the community and, yeah. and, um, uh, might have a, might have trouble like really recognizing law or like uh, the position and the authority might take a different approach, yeah. you know? And so sometimes we dealt with issues where we have, um, things that, or they call it like non-justiciable, meaning like a it's an issue a court shouldn't hear. Okay. Maybe it's related to culture and tradition and something that should be decided by the community or the people and not the court. And so I might try to help mediate it. So my attitude is going to be different. How I deal with them okay. is going to be different. And like we have rules of court. And um, I had a hearing one time where I had uh, two very young tribal parents come and along with their families. Uh, the man came with his his mother and his family and um, the woman came with her grandfather and her family and the mom wanted to talk and the grandfather wanted to talk but according to rules of court they're not um, licensed bar members for a tribal bar so as a technicality they wouldn't have the opportunity to represent them okay and so in recognition of tribal customs and tradition I just stated what the law and the rules said but I told him in recognition of tribal custom and tradition where we have heads of families, you know, speaking on somebody's behalf, I'll recognize that and we'll suspend the rules. And so it's really a lot of opportunity to have adaptability and to be um, and serve in a way that is more responsive to the community and to its needs and to the people before before you. Yeah, and absolutely. so that varies, you know, in some tribal courts, um, like I said, are very formal. They have attorneys and um, a whole bunch of people serving the court and it doesn't feel nothing about it feels tribal you know other than the fact that the the tribe's exercising its sovereignty through its own laws and it might even be similar to state laws and a lot of tribes just adopt um revised rules from other states as opposed to developing their own laws and some tribes um take that serious and so they actually have laws that are more reflective of their own tribal values
Mm -hmm. And so it varies literally from place to place depending on where you go. And I've served not just my own tribal court and where I'm currently working, but other courts. And so have to kind of adapt and pick up and kind of read the community and have a feel for people around you. So it's kind of different from what I see us doing as tribal judges in comparison to state courts, because state judges seem very um, formal and rigid and unchanging. That's how they seem, you know, when, when I observe and then I think about us in tribal court and a lot of times we have to change, like we have to adapt. We don't always expect people to adapt to who we are and how our attitudes are. At least that's the premise I take because I always think of our roles and the reality is we're servants. You know, we're still yeah. civil servants, but I know authority gets to people's heads sometimes and it's easy to, to be different about it. But I mean, you still have to control your courtroom. So sometimes you have to be, you have to be a certain way, you know? Sure. And it's hard sometimes like to be like, you got to be hard and authoritative and because like, people really probably down. have the opposite too right they come in with a bad attitude about yeah. the whole system without even giving it a chance yeah and that seems like it wouldn't be fair either i mean i, I mean i'm sure well maybe not because it, you know it's their lives on the line but i'm sure like people want to go in and be like objection your honor like i mean yeah, if, yeah. if i represented myself i'd have to say it at least once and yeah. if you can't handle the truth <laughs> i mean you can only say it with so many times and then you yeah know. some people get silly with it <laughs> but we get silly too so. yeah yeah, I mean, you can literally all kinds of things happen. I got all kinds of stories. Unfortunately, I can't always tell them. Sure, I bet. Know, yeah, confidentiality, but it's it's funny sometimes. People can it's uh, have a lot of anxiety about going mm -hmm. to court, and so you try to make it a little bit user friendly and a little bit more comfortable, and just really um, we look at tribal courts as courts of equity, like just trying to be equitable mm -hmm. and reasonable, and trying to really come out with outcomes that are gonna that people can live with. You know, sure. So that's. So it's different though from court to and court. And like right now, the the tagline is restorative justice. I hear that all mm -hmm. over the place. Is that probably plays a huge factor when working with tribal courts? I imagine. Yeah, for the most part, but sometimes not always. No. Like I said, some tribal courts are just like westernized courts. Okay. And so they're punitive, and they have a whole different concept and approach. But um, it's really up to the tribe, you know, what kind of position some tribes are like zero tolerance to drugs sure and so it's it's punitive and people you know get put in, into custody and go to jail and serve sentences and do probation and it might look like standard probation you get from the state as opposed to something culturally appropriate mm -hmm. but a lot of tribes i think are um interested in trying to figure out how to do that and make that happen and especially here in california uh, tribal courts are kind of at their infancy stages still building like not all tribal courts in the state of california um exercise like full jurisdiction yeah you might pick a certain subject matter and when i say that i mean like an issue like criminal uh, court or maybe it's dependency for any child welfare act cases coming from the state or dv issues they might just pick what's important or what they think they need to offer their community as opposed to a, a full court of general jurisdiction meaning hearing all kinds of subject matter cases and really exercising their sovereignty I think yeah. a lot of tribes here in California um, aren't fully exercising their sovereignty by um, not fully developing their courts. Courts in California sometimes seem like an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of Public Law 280. Public Law 280 is a piece of federal legislation that basically allows uh, concurrent jurisdiction and criminal issues in certain mandated states in California is one of them and on some civil issues. Okay. So it's a little complex. I feel like all of it, though, is like the importance of it. it's so important because you're dealing with small communities. So mm -hmm. whatever is going to be done uh, for, you know, the punishment that's served out, like you want it to be something that's going to um, positively affect the community. Right. You don't want to be given it the Indian pass or some kind of like you get away because you're Indian or your hey cousin or all that because – Reality is if they, they're harming the community or themselves, mm -hmm. we're going to feel that the community is going to feel that very strongly. Right. And if you can do something to, um, you know, help behaviors or, you know, make a positive outcome, then the, the community is going to feel that positive outcome. Right. You know, and tough love, I'm sure, has got to be a huge part of that. And um, and just being clear, you know, being right. all equitable, like you said, equitable, you know, and having an honest um, look at what's going on and, and exercising the sovereignty in a, in a an honest way right i think that's one of the things that's hard um for our tribal people though is to be honest about the circumstances sure you know one we always want to protect one another yeah not only that uh you don't want to tell you don't want to tattle yeah. 
Like say uh, snitches get stitches, you know. You said it. I did. Yeah, I'm just hey, saying. Hey, like, hey. hey, you hear? You but know, I mean people, it. Hey, no, no, yeah, absolutely. You know, people have that mentality, yeah. and they don't want to tell. Yeah, like, I'll go through your entire hearings. It might be maybe for custody issues, mm -hmm. and uh, people aren't saying anything. They're just kind of alluding to things, but not being specific. And they start hearing uh, maybe the direction I'm going, or I'm asking questions, and. And somebody else starts telling the truth about, we you know, what's really happening. The other person, there's a lot of things I could say. I could say stuff about them too, but I'm not going to say it. I'm thinking, well, that's exactly the kind of stuff I need to know. Like, yeah. I'm making the decisions here and you're holding back on all the important <laughs> stuff, but they don't want to tell, you know. But uh, I see that in our communities and that's a challenge because we can't, as judges, just arbitrarily make decisions on our own without facts. Sure. We sure. can only deal with the information presented, even if. We think we know what's going on. We mm -hmm. can't use it unless it's said. And uh, any outside knowledge, that's the other thing, you know, uh, living in our own communities and uh, serving our own. Well, people. we have our own court. It's called the Court of Public Opinion. Right. Hey, and they're guilty no matter. Because yep. <laughs> you know what I heard? No. You can't live in that world, though, right? You have to no, just. No, you have to ignore yeah. that. Like, people come in like, well, you know how they are. Like, hey. Like, hey, man. <laughs> Despite what I know. like I Even can't. the deep down, you know, you don't want to get into the gossip. Like, like you know no, tell me. Yeah, hey. people say that. Like, well, you know how their family is. Yeah. They, you know, they're always they're always fighting. You know oh, that. Oh, man. And like, yeah, unfortunately, I can't use what you what I think I might know. <laughs> I can only use the information presented to me here. And yeah. Even elders, you know, it's, I've seen some real sad situations where other family members have encouraged elders to maybe file for an order of protection and they'll come in and I'll ask, you know, going through the petition, like, hey, it says that they hit you on this date or they pushed you down, you know, can you tell me what happened? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, like no, whatever yeah. it says, I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like they don't even want to be there, but they also need to be protected. And the other uh, parties who are maybe there with them are like, hey, tell them what happened, you know, tell her like, what they did to you and they don't want to tell. Just want to protect your family yeah, as yeah. best they can. And they don't they don't want to tell. And it's hard to uh, make decisions and help people mm -hmm. when they won't say what needs to be said. Sure. I, I watch a lot of like, um, I don't know, like crime slash gangster movies and mm -hmm. TV and all that kind of stuff. And it's like they have the code of the streets or, you know, like the... Um, got you know, we code. have the same thing on the res though. It's so weird. It's like, yeah, that's how we operate too. You know, you... You don't you don't mess with elders. You treat them good. You know you don't mess with kids. You treat them good. Those are the two sacred parts of the population. You know you don't um, take or hurt you know women and 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 all that. You know and then like yeah you don't rat people out. You know all of these kind of like rules of the streets. You know right. it's like we definitely govern by that. You know and and I know um, I don't every res is different obviously, but I know some res you get whooped up. You try to you know you mess around with that kind of stuff. You don't. You don't do that you know there's just no's you know and and i think that goes back to a time when we were self-governing ourselves a little bit more um and we'd, we'd rather govern ourselves than to send somebody out to the legal system you know they might get you know 100 years ago they might get killed and hung and all these kinds right. of things and maybe it's just better to whip the dude up a little bit or something and set him straight um or just kick him out of the community you know or something but but uh, i think times have kind of changed too mm -hmm. though we have to um, you know, we're right now. I feel like we're in as a society, like all the different reses and the Native nations are are working their way out of trauma, you know, mm -hmm. and they're working their way out of all this bad history. And it's like you can't really heal and you can't really uh, put attention on a lot of these issues if you're not going to be honest about them. You know, number one thing is you got to be honest and just say, you know, th address the problem. This is a problem. This is what the problem is. And um, whether it's violence or an abuse or a sexual abuse or our elder abuse, like. You have to actually say, hey, this is a problem. This is what's going on. Now mm -hmm. let's address it, you know. Uh, but it's hard. I know it's got to be hard for our people, you know. And, and those cycles continue, you know. You right. you protect your cousin, your brother, your nephew, son, whatever. And, um, and you know, I just named all boys. The women who are beating up the men out there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, no, you, you protect these guys. And then they're teaching that behavior to someone younger, and it just continues. So at some point, you got to put the foot down and say, no, we're not going to allow that. And uh, I guess move forward. I guess huh? mm -hmm. that's where we're at right now. I suppose. Yeah, I would. I would think for um, the most part, that's where we're at. Yeah. You know, like every community, I think engages it differently, and I see a lot more, um, a lot more use of the court uh -huh. by people like they're coming there for resolution, and um, actually respecting you know the authority of the courts and the tribes, and I think that's real important because um, for courts and law enforcement serving tribal communities. I mean, even though they might be tribal sometimes, 
the historical trauma is still there. Sure. You know, in terms of it being a system. And uh, I know even myself as a judge and being a tribal person, I don't always see myself as part of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one day I was talking to my brothers and I was like, oh, man. And we we're talking about like courts and law enforcement. And you know, <coughs> excuse me, when my brother said, um, man, like, you know, they were like down with the system. Uh -huh. And I was like, right. And I was really agreeing. <laughs> and they're like, hey, you're part of the system. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a second. That's different. <laughs> Yeah. Because I don't see myself like that. Do you ever feel down from it? Like, you know, doing these cases and you're seeing all this, like, I mean, a lot of it's got to be negative that you're having to deal with, you know, seeing families going through it, seeing people having these times in their life. Sometimes their lowest time in their life, mm -hmm. they do something stupid um, or get themselves involved, make a decision that's not good for them, a bad decision. You know, a lot of people, good people make bad decisions and, and bad outcomes come out. So you're always kind of seeing that. Does that ever um, bring you down? Does it oh, put yeah. you in a bad spot? And then, and how do you deal with that? Like, how do you not live in that? I mean, how do you get yourself out of the funk and feel positive and good? I, that's what we're at gatherings like every weekend. Yeah, no, <laughs> I know. I feel that. <laughs> we're at gatherings yeah. every weekend. Um, hey, speaking of which, I saw you. I saw you at um, Sam Manuel. I saw I your your boy went viral. Those that don't know, uh, Claudette's son is Zion, Mr. Zion White, out there, mm -hmm. um, singer extraordinaire. And I uh, seen him and some of the crew, and man, they were getting rained on in San Manuel, oh, yeah. man. That's like the powwow that almost didn't happen because they, they had the power adage from the winds and the fire, and then they said, we're going to move it to December. There won't be no winds. There'll be, And then it just like like rains like crazy. They end up cutting the um, the Saturday night you know, live. Mm -hmm. They cut that out. They cut out the grand entry and all of that and let everything dry out for the next day. But the bird session went on, man. Yeah, you guys yeah. are out there dancing in the rain. Yeah, Uncle Wally said, um, hey, you want to take a break, singers, dancers? Sit down, take a break for a while. We're like, no, just keep going. So we went for it. So went for it, huh? Yeah. Wash it off good. Yep. <laughs> All the rain came down. Absolutely. That felt pretty good, though, I imagine, huh? Yeah, it really did. It really did. Um, at first, we were like a little hesitant to go out there because uh, the ground itself, even though it wasn't full blown raining yet, was yeah. kind of like a little damp. Okay. And um, we're, I know Zion was telling me, well, don't, don't stand out there, you're going to fall. And, uh, <laughs> really busting those moves yeah. she went down low all the way to the ground we did it anyway yeah yeah but it wasn't too bad and as the rain progressed it kind of got a little mushy and okay a little bit more slippery but we made it so yeah. it was cool to watch online though i saw like a samuel put out a little video mm -hmm. and um yeah man i think it like went indian viral real quick i seen it shared all over the place oh, really people nice. were just digging it yeah it's cool to just see like you know no rain's gonna stop it you know i mean mm -hmm. Same time, it's kind of like I was at, you know, I was on my couch keeping warm <laughs> watching. <laughs> I was like, yeah, good thing to make that travel. But is is that your way though to kind of get rid of all the the negativity? Yeah, I would say for the most part, that's my way. Is like, um, I mean, for me, birds always healing, mm -hmm. and I just you know kind of let myself go and reminds me to like to be thankful for everything I have and and all of that. So uh, they call it when you're exposed and you watch and you observe of you know negativity and things around you vicarious trauma mm. and so um, a lot of judicial officers experience vicarious trauma but based on the things we deal with what we have to see and what we have to hear like um, sometimes we see a good side of humanity you mm. know in the courts when families come together or people step up to care for children or maybe concede on issues and you know do something righteous like that's nice to witness but by far and large you know people are there hurt they're upset they're mad and you see like the the worst of humanity sometimes mm -hmm. in, uh, in terms of what people deal with and then you see like you know issues of abuse and like extreme issues of abuse and have to read reports you know about what happens to children and to people or how somebody was victimized generally women sometimes men too but um like when you see those things, like you can't ignore it, you know, especially living in the community. Yeah. You see these people from, you know, face to face all the time and um, can't treat them differently. You yeah. Know, you have to try to stay open to that and, and remain neutral, you know, and like you're human. So you naturally you have feelings, but uh, you have to put those things aside in order to try to do what's equitable and right. And sometimes we have to make decisions that we don't even agree with just based on the law. Yeah. You know, and that's the the hard thing because people uh, don't always understand how the law works. And so uh, education from the bench is one of the big things we do trying to explain to people, you know, why we reached a certain thing or trying to rationalize and explain it to people. But you definitely walk away uh, and carry that with you, you know, yeah. 
and you see the kids in the community, you know, you like you can't be um, vocal and direct about what you see either. You know, you just have to try to act normal and kind of suppress and work through those things. But for me, like, I think that's what keeps me balanced is one, my son and the relationship I have with him. But then just doing, you know, bird and focusing mm -hmm. on my culture. And like I said, um, I'm trying to focus on the positive things in my work, like. I'm glad I'm able to be of service and to hear and do those things as opposed to somebody coming from the outside who maybe doesn't understand the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you, if you uh, had seen Tribal Justice, but in there I talk or I make a, a statement saying that, um, you know, I'm there, I'm from the community, I'm from the reservation, and I'm not immune from anything that that means. You know, like seeing abuse, alcoholism, mm -hmm. and molestation and all the bad things that you see happening in communities like myself and my family we're not immune from that yeah you know we've all experienced that or seen that witnessed it had it close to us or been a victim so like you can't um can't ignore those things you know right yeah i, I definitely feel that you know and i think sometimes when uh you know, you get out of the reservation sphere and there's um i've come across a lot of people who have, have found their um their traces back in their lineage you know they found out they're native and they they have a, a history there they have a family line there and um they kind of advocate or they they kind of take they kind of speak as like i'm a native and all this like their experience and i don't want to take nothing against or away from anybody in that that scenario but i think there's definitely a difference uh a different perspective there than somebody that's grown up on the res and are in a native community mm -hmm. that's around a lot of that trauma who's seen that trauma so I feel like when you come from those populations, everybody's got a family member that's like that archetype, whether it's the alcoholic or someone who's abusing or a violent person in the family. I mean, it's like every family has those archetypes and our cousins or, you know, your extended family. Mm -hmm. You just grow up seeing it right. so much. And it's like you can go all around different reses and tribes and nations and and you see it all over. It's just kind of like what we've had to experience and heal from what we're healing from. And I, you don't sometimes see that from people on the outside who have that perspective. But I think it's an important perspective. But when you go out, you know, uh, if you're in a university setting or a legal setting or, you know, at a conference or something and, you know, people see you very polished. They just maybe right. assume that you don't come from that background. Right. And it's like, no, I grew up in and around that stuff, you know, right. and uh, and it's 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 part of like it's again, it's part of what you carry. It's just like right. wearing a, a beaded piece or a shirt saying who you are. It's like you carry that, too. Like that's part of your your native perspective. Right. Um, yeah. All those life experiences really like you know shape who you are and you take that with you you know mm -hmm. in terms of understanding having sympathy and compassion yeah. and um being realistic mm -hmm. you know about people's circumstances like um a, a lot of people i think would have that expectation you're saying like about being polished or mm -hmm. for me i think people you know think like i'm immune to things and haven't had that experience and that's why i got the opportunities i have or I've had the opportunity to have the education I do, but that's not it at all. You know, just yeah. a, a lot of other op a lot of the reasons why I am where I am. And like, um, I think it's important though to like acknowledge those things and be realistic. I, st I share that stuff from the bench all the time, yeah. you know, to people just so they understand where I'm coming from that. So they know that, hey, I know where you're coming from. I know where you're yeah. at. And uh, to try to encourage them, you know, like I'll share with people who are going through drug addiction and I see the impacts it has on their children or through dependency hearings because they're losing their children. And I'll just share with them, you know, like what I went through seeing my dad as an alcoholic, you know, parent and we lost him to a drug overdose, cocaine and heroin. And, um, you know, people are surprised to hear that. They don't mm -hmm. know that. And so when I share that with them, they really take it back and I'll just share with them, you know, what I went through as a child and the impacts I had dealing with an alcoholic parent you know, and how that Im impacted and affected me. And or I might know them through the community and I'll tell them like, you know, like I know how you grew up, you mm -hmm. know, you want better for your children. You can do better. I've seen you do good and to be able to share with them that way. And it's not a way to um, put them down, but really to empower them, you know, to yeah. let them know like, hey, I, like I'm the same as you. I'm coming from the same thing you are. You know, I'm lucky I had one stable parent, you know, but um, and some people don't. But at the same time, like, you know, seeing what we see and what we were exposed to, like, it just, you could go either one way or the other, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's why I try to share with people just so they, they know, like, hey, I get you. I understand where you're coming from, you know, and try to encourage people 
more than anything we try to tell them that in court like i'll tell them that we're not here to hurt you we're here to help you yeah we want you to do better like we need you to change your behavior we want better for you and we're not just here to to punish you does that does that really like all of this kind of i mean it must motivate you in your relations with your son to really try to be there as much as you can for him i mean i, I remember i mean when he was young guy just a little mm -hmm. guy out there and i feel like i've seen that kid grow up um you know bird singing and playing piano and dancing and um he's always had his unique bird dance style with he used to have that big long braided <laughs> whipping around like a big snake and it's funny because i see like some of the younger guys have like adopted his style you know and i could see it mm -hmm. and I, I hear sometimes people go oh he's that kid's doing the zion because he has like that style of dance where his braid goes whipping around and uh but i you know i remember being a little guy doing that and just being at all the gatherings and um it's not always easy to go to all these g g events you know the gatherings and the you know be there all night for the peon and and then um uh, as he gets older you know towards adulthood you know being there to support him in the in the ceremonial stuff the wakes and things like that and um just being there for them is, is that motivated you as a mom to kind of have that strong relationship oh yeah definitely um like he's i hate to say it because i i know i get after parents sometimes when they rely on their children uh -huh. i see them it's a different kind of reliance almost a dependency but well, i'm relying on my kids right now to work the camera i'm like make, check the camera make sure it's rolling no, I'm yeah kidding. yeah like yeah. he's my best friend you know like we're really close Reese? and <laughs> we we enjoy each other actually and I told yeah. him like I'm lucky, you know, like that we actually like each other. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's real important for me to you know be the best parent I can be. I'm a single parent, so it's important for me to be there for him and to give him opportunities that you know that I might not have had. Uh -huh. And just you always want better for your kids, and then uh, to like try to connect him to men or other people in our family and in the communities mm -hmm. you know that we're in to try to you know be a role model to him too and. I'm real thankful, you know, we got really good people in our lives, people that have been there to support him and to support myself. But yeah, being a good parent and being there as much as I can, like I see how easy it is for kids to go the other way. Yeah. You know, but I'm I know I'm hard as a parent in terms of holding him accountable and I'm realistic too. Like and now I got that from my mom because she was always like that with this, like, you know, kids do bad things. Some parents are like, not my kid, and my mom's like, Hey. I ain't going to say that because you never know, you know, <laughs> yeah. you guys might have. And so try to be realistic, you know, have realistic expectations for him. And at the end of the day, I just want him happy, you know, mm -hmm. whatever that means. And as long as he's respecting people and meeting his calling and, you know, doing what he can do, then then I'm thankful. You know, he's a good kid and he listens. What do you suggest to, um, to like other single moms or, you know, because I come across parents sometimes and they, uh, they want to get their kid involved in, in like the culture, you know, mm -hmm. um, whether it's singing or dancing or, um, you know, any of that peon or something. I mean, what, what do you recommend to parents that are in that, that are like the single moms that want to get their kid involved, their mm -hmm. son involved? Like I humbled myself, you know, in terms of like sometimes in our cultures, they say it's the men who are supposed to be responsible or that's right. to bring them nah, in. Nay, just give me <laughs> while we're all messing up. Me we're all messing up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking about misogyny <laughs> uh, later. Yeah, yeah, my misogynistic <laughs> memes, man. My yeah. wife's getting all mad at me. Anyways, yeah. but no, I'm sorry. Good yeah, job. But, <laughs> but for, uh, you know, I guess uh, for other parents who want to do that, I just say be consistent about it. You okay. know, don't be afraid to be humble in this day and age. Like, the reality is, you know, there are a lot of single single moms, you know. Yeah. And so I think our, our people have been real receptive to that. I remember... Uh, we lost my, I come from a family, a traditional family, and we lost our uncles, you know, and uh, didn't have my dad and and my grandfather, my paternal grandfather passed early and so did my maternal uh, before I was born. And so we didn't have them to connect to. So we grew up knowing our great uncles and they were good leaders and really strong traditional people for our tribe. And, and they passed before um, my son was born, except for one, my uncle, Steve Kelly. Uh, Zion was just a baby when um, he passed and I, that was our hope was that you know he had take him under his wing and help teach him and then generationally uh, singing and uh, singing took a, a miss for our men like my brothers mm -hmm. or, or during school at first didn't sing for a while until they finally picked it up but our uncles they didn't they didn't sing but our great uncles did so generationally we had that gap they're fluent speakers and stuff and knew our culture but they didn't actively sing. And so when my uncle Steve passed, I ended up going to Willard, you know, Willard Golding mm -hmm. Sr. and told him, hey, I know my uncle, you know, you sang with my uncle and he helped you. Like, I'm asking you to help my son. 
you know, will you help my son? And he wants to learn. He's little right now, but he's interested and wants to sing. Will you help him? He's like, yeah, sure. He said, I'll be glad to. And I was thankful, you know, as a woman, for one, to um, go to a man and to mm -hmm. ask him, like, you know, that could mean a lot of things to different people and they could be intimidated by that. But like I said, I think our our traditional leaders are realistic about our circumstances these yeah. days, you know, and we have like early death rates for, you know, our, even our adults and we pass at early ages. So we don't have grandparents sometimes and people to do that for us. So I just, you know, say, you know, be real about it and humble yourself and, you know, go to somebody and talk to them. And I think we got enough traditional people who are making it a lot easier these days to learn, you know, and I know before it just used to be in your family. If your family didn't, wasn't doing it, then you didn't have an opportunity, Yeah. you know, but, but now you see just a real resurgence of it mm -hmm. and it feels good, you know, it feels good to see it. And, uh, one of the things I know we've been working on at home and, um, and even for Zion, like uh, just a correlation I make, I think when I see him and how he grew up and the opportunities he had uh, to learn tradition and culture, um, I'm thinking like, oh, here we are. As, you know, I think we come from a traditional family. He's here in the middle of it. He's got opportunity. He's learning. He's doing good. And, um, you know, I'm thankful for that. And it wasn't until this past summer that he had a really powerful experience, like uh, when he was going through the we'd have cycle and looking at um, early ethnography and learning more about uh, the meanings of the song and the creation. And uh, it was like he had an, uh, a real wake up, you know, mm -hmm. and he was like, and it consumed him literally, like even I had provided him some materials and things that I'd saved, even just uh, throughout time, my mom would collect like traditional leaders or people like um, political leaders even would write a, a story or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, handwrite it and they make copies or type it out. And like, she kept all those things. Like, you know, people would talk about what they knew or what was shared or what something meant. And uh, I kept all of the things she kept and I'd come across my own things. I'd keep them and I would read them. And, um, and I gave it to him and like, Hey, you know, Hey, maybe you can learn more. Like, here's some of the things that people shared. And man, he would, every time I turned around this summer, he was just like reading, like up, yeah. I'd go by and he was laying there reading and, I was asking him, like, um, are you, you know, are you learning? And he was like, man, mom, it's crazy. And he'd come out and start explaining something to me about early civilization, like, you know, globally or, yeah. you know, worldwide or something and how it tied back to what we were doing. And he was just like all excited, but uh, it hit him in a powerful way, like just the connection to our people and our creation and, and in a way that he really internalized it where for the first time, like he said, I know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I know what I'm supposed to do in life. And to think like, oh, we, you know, here we are thinking we're traditional people, but to see that connection that he was, he was able to make. And I told him, man, this is what I've been waiting for, you know, your entire life. And, and I told him, this is what I want our people to have the opportunity, our young people, when we think we have nothing, like I want them to know, like just how we're created, we have everything. And so we're working right now with a couple of elders back home uh, to try to create that opportunity like for other people to learn sure. to apply those things to daily life because we don't, you know, we, right. a lot of people get up and can sing and dance. And I'm not saying that that's not a bad thing, but that's not enough. Yeah. That's not going to be enough to sustain us. Yeah. We feel good about it. And, you know, we feel grounded and tied, but when you start to learn your true creation and the origins and literally, you know, like how you were energized and created and all the connections you have to all the, these sacred places and spaces, like it, um, it does something different to you, you know, mm -hmm. and it changes you. And that's the kind of experiences we want to bring to our people right now. So we're working to make that happen. But I think if um, parents, you know, like want to connect their children, like you have to be consistent about it. And so it's a sacrifice. And yeah. I know you guys go through that and it's not just you, you take, you know, your extended family and, you know, bring in kids with you and, you know, fill up your, your bands and <laughs> you know, do what you can Sometimes do. Sometimes two bands. But exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, that's so important, you yeah. know, and it, it's a commitment, you know, I've had people around me tell us, oh, we want to learn, you know, oh, we want to do this. I'm like, oh, good, you know, do this and try to tell them, you know, what to do or give them opportunity like, oh, hey, we're going to go out to the dunes this weekend or oh, yeah. we're be out in Octillo or oh, got a birthday party yeah. and like. They want to learn to bird dance, but they're yeah. working on their cheerleading more than they yeah, are their bird dance. Yeah, you know, so yeah. you don't want to be critical, but yeah. um, they got to understand when those opportunities come, like they come, you know, yeah. you got to seize them.
it's definitely a calling you know i i feel like most singers that are older that that lead it that i've spoken with have all had a moment like what your son had maybe even a couple but definitely one one moment where really um it's galvanizing their mind and you know just that this is for them but it's mm -hmm. a calling and i think that some of the lifestyle can be really uh, arduous and difficult and if you don't have that that real deep motivation a calling you do kind of just fall out over a period of time you might be able to hang a couple years or a few years or the cameras are out or if you're getting paid or if life's going good or you know um but when it gets hard when there's nobody around or you have some real responsibility or if your health is you know your health goes mm -hmm. and you still have to do these things that's where you see like you have to dig deep you know and it's a very spiritual thing and um you get through it you'll do it you know and mm -hmm. it's been done and and all the old ones who some are still around a lot of them are gone now that you know we saw growing up um they did it and it seemed i always think back i look back back at them it's like they were like robots because I don't remember their voices ever being tired or them looking like they couldn't like sometimes i get up there and i'm like barely making it and i'm a healthy guy and i'm like i don't remember seeing those guys ever look like that you know and they were old and were not healthy yeah and it's just like they're just robots just cranking through you know and just the knowledge they had to be able to to explain the song in their language and then the different dialects around different language you know they knew different languages you know not just like we're just struggling to learn our own language solid you know and like they knew the different languages of the areas they went to go sing at and to be able to share you know all the different knowledges of the song and the purpose and the, the creation stories all of that stuff that we're really trying to learn you know mm -hmm. but to know these old dudes had that and just to see them in their element i know for me i always think like i'll never think i'm all that when it comes to singing because i just i seen those dudes you can't see those guys and ever think you're something because they were just such, like at such a different league right. different level of, of um ability just the, the strength of their voice, the knowledge, and then just the, the heart that they put into it. You know, I mean, some of these guys sing until they were just gone. There was nothing left, you know, right. of them as a person. And it's like, again, I don't remember them sounding bad. <laughs> they would sound good, you know, and I was just like, man. But um, it's a, just a deep calling that I've, I've seen in people to be able to do that. And um, you yeah. the resources, like yeah. having next to nothing, but still being able to get everywhere and make it. Yeah, no car, no nothing. Like, can you get a ride to their side, you know? And I think about that because, like, I have a decent car for the most part, usually, you know, and we're driving here, we're driving there. And I think back to, like, the 80s when these guys would be rolling in, and it's like, their cars weren't reliable, you know, but they would take that leap of faith to come out and mm -hmm. and sing and, and uh, you know, like your uncle would come out and he'd have a driver in the car sleeping, you know, mm -hmm. to drive him back because it was like they weren't going to give him, we didn't have rooms here to give, you right. know, could have yeah. stayed at someone's Sometimes house, they, but, they but it's like, give either. yeah, and then, and they just came out, you know, we'd feed him, take care of him as best we could and make sure he got home okay and, and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's like they didn't have all the resources we have now, you know. No, no, no. Just strength. That's all they had. <laughs> Inner strength. <clears throat> so going from that to where we're at now, what, what do you think about uh, contests? Are you a proponent or are you against it? So people kind of get like, I feel like people yeah. get like, um, I don't know if me, people go like, well, I don't contest. I don't believe in it. And it's like, oh, yeah. oh, that's cool, you know. But yeah, sometimes but I think, to... not to throw shade, but sometimes I think, well, I don't see you dance anywhere. <laughs> a little right. in this contest. But for me, you know, I have my opinion. What's your opinion on all that stuff? Well, a lot of people out here are saying that. Sorry, leads, but sometimes it's the leads that are saying that. Hey. I'm thinking like, hey, you're yeah. getting paid to show up. Like, you don't need a dance. I mean, <laughs> that's just my, my yeah. position. And uh, Mike, don't come after me for that. Hey, but, uh, <laughs> shout out. But that's hey. the reality sometimes. You yeah. know, like, like I contest. And honestly, it's a challenge and it's a burden sometimes. Too. You have to get yeah. there for signups, leave, you know, you several hours away for that to happen. You know you're going to stay and play peon, so you might not be able to get a room. You don't know if yeah. you're going to find a place to sleep or what's going to happen. And uh, I'm not complaining about it. That's just the reality, you know, we deal with when we do it. And I I compete because I want to try to help cover my trips. Yeah. So I can get to the next gathering. Yeah. And so I compete, but I'd rather not. You know, like, we show up anyway. Yeah. Like, we try to budget to show up anyway. Like, if it's um fantasy or, you know, other yeah. places that don't have competitions and all we do is jam like man we're we're there anyway well that's what like, i think too is the people that are really like well i you know i don't i don't believe in the contest and all that but it's like the people i do see contests and everywhere it's not like they only go to contest areas right. i always, i see them everywhere you know and right. i feel like um especially out your way i see like a lot of the ladies they're not just there at the contest or the powwows or the social times they're there for the ceremony stuff too mm -hmm. and, and they're not getting paid for that you know it's just something yeah. they love to do and um you're I not gonna i think it's fun yeah but 
we didn't have it, we didn't have it. Yeah. You know, but um, like, you know, in all honesty, like I said, I signed up for every contest just yeah. so I could try to make money to get to the next one. And, and I think when people are critical about it, like, I don't think that's fair. Like, yeah. you know, that's that's how I feel about it. Like, I don't think it's fair when people are judging the next person and are critical about it. Like, they're choosing to do it. They're enjoying themselves. And Tribe wants to sponsor it, then fine. If yeah. Tribe's not able to, they're going to, you know, put on an event and it doesn't, you know, have a contest. That's cool, too. You know, if you can show up and be a part of it and you want to and you're able to, cool. But, like, if they're doing it, I don't think people should be that critical about it either. And, and I get that it takes away from it sometimes. You know, I'll acknowledge that, too. And especially for people that might just be there for that and there are those people too, you know? Yeah. But the reality is like, you know, some of us, we're just trying to get somewhere, you know? Yeah. And lots of times I see a lot of the families do it, like the entire family does it. Yeah. And for the same thing, you know? My family does it. And, yeah. you know, I'll be honest, like, it's a nice way to motivate the kids too sometimes, you know, to like, and I always tell them it's not about if you win or lose, you know, it's just politics out there too. So you might, you might've been the only one on step and you may not win still, you know, it's not always accurate to like how good you dance or not, but, but you know, I tell them it's, it doesn't hurt to get out there and represent your family and your people. You know, if there's, um, you know, like 10 kids out there and there's nobody from your area and you're out there, now you're representing your whole nation, you'll try right. and do your best, you know, it's good to do that. And I know me, it motivates me because sometimes, you know, I'll sit there and be lazy. I won't want to get up out of my chair or off the bench or, you know, I'm just singing and, you know, or, or, you know, and I'm just watching everyone. I'm enjoying it, but I'm just kind of being lazy. And then it's like, oh, I signed up. Oh, I better get up and go dance. And then, and then it kind of forces me to get out there. And then after my, I get kind of going, then it's like, then I feel like dancing. I'm all into it. My blood's pumping and I'll dance and have fun until I leave, you know, mm -hmm. but sometimes that'll be enough to motivate me. But I know like the first time I got out there, I was really like, I didn't want to do it. I did not want to do it. I was just like, oh man, this is nerve wracking. And then as someone who leads songs, sometimes I'm sitting there like, I feel like people want to look at me and if I'm messing up, everyone's yeah, going to yeah. know. But I was like, whatever. But I'll be honest, the, what motivated me was just that. I was low on cash. I had brought all my kids out and all these things. And, and I thought, man, you know, like if I win, then maybe I have an opportunity to, um, you know, my kids instead of eating Del Taco, maybe we can stop by a real taco shop. You know what I mean? Or get some Jack in a Box. So or do something. Yeah, do yeah. something. Yeah. And just, or just to have that, that, that um, safety net. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so. I, it you know, motivated me and I got there and danced and I got like a third or second or something, but, but it was cool. Cause then I was like, okay, that helps. Like, I'm not going to go buy rims for my car with that. Like that's going to go right into the pot to, to help the kids get my kids, you know, get home, right. eat and gas and all that. And, and, um, did you never know? Like sometimes people show up, man, and they just got enough to get there and back. So, you know, like uh coin means like that too. I feel mm -hmm. like someone's like, Hey, can I coin me? I'll go ahead, man. Cause I don't know if they have any money. That might be what gets them home. You know right. what I mean? And I don't want them to, I want everyone to get home safe. That's my my attitude on it. You yeah, know? I mean, you can go a whole year without winning anything anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's the you thing know, too. It's, it's like you never know. Yeah, so, yeah, but no, I'm teasing on the leads. But I hear some of them being critical, and and yeah. I don't always think it's fair. But I get mm -hmm. and can respect what they say too when they say it takes away from things. Yeah, but uh, to me, there's a time and place, and like uh, I hear one of the leads say often, like if you're singing at a social gathering then it's for something social. Uh -huh. And so I don't see it so much as ceremonial. It might be personal, it might be spiritual, yeah. but it's not ceremonial. Yeah, You know, so to me, if we're, we want to do a contest and tribes are willing to sponsor and put something together, then I don't see anything wrong with it. And like I said, it, to me, it just helps families do what they want to do, keeps people going from one place to the next. And if not, we'll figure it out and make it happen anyway. Sure. You know what I tell my boys? I tell them this because like, you know, I used to always have people ask me, like, about the songs. Like, they asked me, are these the same songs that are sung, like, for the social that are sung at the funeral, too? Like, don't seem like they, why they'd be sung at both, you know? Because a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people that have kind of, uh, our families that have kind of lost out in the in our, why we do what we do, you know? So I try to always educate, and I know all the other um, leads in our area try to do that also. But, you know, I, I was telling my kids, I said, you know, to me, what I, what I think of is I think, like, when we go to the gatherings, go to the powwows, go to all the social time, mm -hmm. I think like that's for me. It's like a real selfish time almost. Like I'm there to have fun, I'm there to build my knowledge, you know, uh, talk to people and I'm there to, you know, for them, you know, that's what they should be doing. They should be enjoying it. You're out there dancing, that's for you. Build yourself up, feel confident in your culture, all this kind of stuff. But it's for you, you know? Mm -hmm. But when you go do the ceremonial stuff, that's not for you. That's for them. That's for uh, the person who's passed or that's for the family. That's for those people they have called you there. And I said, what that does is it creates uh, two different mentalities. So if you're not feeling good or you're tired, you got better things to do. All right, well, you don't have to go to this because that's just for you. 
If you don't want to do that, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. But then this thing, it's not for you. So if you're tired or you're a little injured or you're sick or you don't want to be there, tough. It's not about you. Suck it up, right? Suck it up, buttercup. And uh, you got to go and do what you've been asked to do and get it done the best you can mm -hmm. because it's not about you. It's about that. And um, and so, like, you want to come to me. It's like you want to go over here and dance all crazy and do all that. Well, hey, it's on you, man. You're just enjoying yourself. Go get crazy. But over here – well, I want to dance. I want to do this way. I want to do it. No, no, no. It's not about you. It's about the ceremony and what's going on there. So that's how I tell the kids, like, you know, I know there's times you don't want to maybe be at these things or it's the night gets long or you're tired or you're hungry or you got better things to do. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like it's tough. That's not about you. This mm -hmm. is the time you give. This is the right. time you give yourself, give your time, your body, your mind, your everything. You just give. And because it's not about you, you're giving that as part of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now over here, it's not so much of a sacrifice. This is about you. So that's kind of in my mind. I kind of separated a little bit. And um, because, you know, our way, it's kind of like you dance one way, one place, and you dance another, the other place. Like you're not going to get all crazy at, at a funeral. But at a gathering, you want to go dance around, act all hoot and holler? I mean, <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> yeah. I can't do the backflip, but I'll try. I can't do the splits. Shout out to Lyman, but I'll try yeah. Lyman, but I can't do it. But, uh, yeah, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I know we've getting uh, recently back home, people are starting to um, try to get back to protocol and uh -huh. get more strict about what happens, like in our big house and stuff. And I, I respect that. I appreciate that they're doing that. But again, like, um, I think we're so critical of ourselves, you know, and, yeah. of each other and, and you know, the whole lateral violence thing and like we can truly be our own worst enemies you know yeah in terms of how we treat each other that whole crab in a bucket thing we hear yeah. it all the time but we don't do enough to change it or speak out against it and uh, i think we'd be a lot further along as people and you know in our governments and in our communities if we did speak out about it you know like we just had an event a couple of weeks ago i think the same day as fantasy we stayed behind um we didn't go out friday night and we stayed on the reservation so we could attend that meeting mm -hmm. and myself and Zion and um, you know, just kind of seeing what it was about, hearing what they were talking about. And I thought they were doing really good, you know, just kind of outlining some of the things that used to happen, kind of some of the things that families would do and maybe do differently from one another. But it started to get um, to me to a place where it just was real unreasonable. People were starting to say, well, when you're in the big house and you're, um, you know, what do you think about covers on the, the caskets? Mm -hmm. Somebody was like, I don't like it. We shouldn't do it. And somebody was like, yeah, they put, you know, team colors up or pick flowers that are for the teams or their favorite this or that or wearing ribbon shirts. You know, we didn't wear ribbon shirts. That's not a Quetzalcan thing. And uh -huh. we're kind of getting, you know, really extreme about it. And I'm sitting there listening and, and you know, me and Zion are looking at each other and we're like, mm, maybe that's a little too rough. You know, like it should be up to the family's choice, too. Yeah. And uh, finally, I just put my hand up and I told my city, you know, the reality is if we, we look at the first cremation, um, like you're saying, OK, dress shirts are OK. And I knew the families like they might all coordinate colors of dress shirts like we didn't have shirts either. You know? Yeah, so, they were dressing back then. Yeah, different. Yeah. A lot of things we we're doing are like things that we all were making up. You know, it's all yeah. new protocol, all things that we just created. But if you get back to the fundamentals, you know, the first cremation, because they were talking about hair and uh burning hair and uh like we don't burn hair we bury hair we put hair in water and i you know I respect them like the teachings that they had because they yeah. learned from somewhere and they're older so i do respect it but you look back as people in our origins like we went to the first cremation or like the animals would cut their tail and their fur and put it in the fire yeah like at some point we changed all of that you know and so like i think we need to be a little bit uh, honest about what we're doing today too like it, a lot of it is made up yeah you know and so we all just need to pick something that we can live with and that still maintains respect and the dignity to mm -hmm. what we started and from our origins and i think we hurt each other you know when we start treating each other some way and making fun of each other and putting each other down because we're not doing things like the next person but yeah i think that stuff's important to think about i feel like with the the dresses i know at our way there's always a lot of controversy on the dresses because um you know like out on the river there's kind of like the the set this is what we wear type of right. thing for the dresses and out here in the coastline you know it's kind of like um there was a lot of years like when i was a kid that women were really wearing ribbon dresses they were just uh 
kind of wear muumu dresses or what they wore you know mm-hmm. that was that but there wasn't a lot of ladies out here when I was a kid I don't remember that many ladies dancing you know some older ladies and a couple ladies here and there and so when we had our big resurgence in the 90s you know and everybody wanted to dance and all of that and it was a beautiful time all the little young ladies and they started doing um they went out and made the dresses and it was kind of like the style they made at that time is kind of what's kind of flourished as that's the quote unquote kumi bird dress but that's kind of like when it was developed in the 90s in that mm-hmm. time and um and so people have like you know what's the right way the wrong way and it's kind of like you know, I, my, uh, I'd kind of kind of get on a fence. Well, you know, it should be. And then I had to stop myself go, well, realistically, we used to wear bark skirts, you know. Right. And then our women went into the, you know, you had to wear this type of dress because that's what the uh, the missionary, missionaries were like. You have to wear, mm-hmm. you know, cloth dress. And then and it turned into a um, the boarding school era. You know, they came, our women came back, young ladies, and, and they were told this is how you sew. This is how you make a dress. This is your pattern. And so they were teaching their daughters that. And that's what our – our women wore for like 60, 70 years. You can see it in the pictures. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is what, you know, the one piece dress. Um, they didn't have elastic back then. So they would just sew, you know, kind of like the belt line. Very similar to your guys' dress. Mm-hmm. And that was what was, was uh, worn for all that time. And um, that's what our women grew up and lived in. Those were their dresses they lived in. Mm-hmm. A lot of them were made out of like flower sacks and things because that's right. what the material they had. And so a lot of these these ceremonies, uh, are parts of the ceremony that we have now for us, of um, they're not. 500 years old or not a thousand years old or not there are things that we've had to kind of retrofit and mm-hmm. and develop as our people moved on you know the ribbon right. shirts are like that and and to me you know i like that i like i like the ribbon shirt i like the ribbon dress i think it's beautiful and to me it, it speaks to a time of my grandparents or my parents and my, their their parents and going back like that you know but I, I'm, I'm cognizant that it wasn't like that 200 years right. ago you know the cowboy hat out here and all our people were they rode horses and were ranchers and all these things and um and so the cowboy hat kind of is a, is a time of that you know um it kind of goes that my dad wore a cowboy hat so when i sing i wear that and like for him you know mm-hmm. i'm not a cowboy my cousin john's a cowboy <laughs> we call him cowboy you know he's got the boots on and everything yeah. he's got a horse somewhere right now he's probably riding but but me i'm not a cowboy you know i mean i've i've ridden a horse they got thrown off a horse but when in the 80s, when I was young, everybody in this community, they still had horses a lot, you right. know, and my sisters had horses. It was a thing, but I don't wear a hat. I wear it for peon, really, you know. Mm-hmm. But there is lateral hate out there. Um, I throw it. I throw it at the women for playing peon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. I feel like- <laughs> ah, just kidding. So what made you jump in on uh, on uh, uh, peon? What made that? Was that a hard transition to jump in with the women's peon? Uh, no. Uh, we learned as youth back home. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. My my uncle Steve. Uh. He played and he had a women's team. Okay. My aunt Nomi then used to play. Yeah. And Steve's actually my um, uh, my grandfather's brother. Okay. And so uh, what was in the family and stuff, and then uh, probably was about fourteen, fifteen, I think, when we started to learn how to play. Yeah. And so when when we played we played for a while back home we didn't really travel we didn't have the resources yeah and then as soon as i was out of school i went to college but uh, we played back home we'd play in tournaments and stuff and we played the elders and uh, we were pretty decent back home the youth that i played with and when they'd get mad at us and all of a sudden hey you shouldn't be playing and yeah because we were beating the the elders or the women and uh, it was a lot of fun i enjoyed it and had taken a break for it for a while and then came up here and st- you know, I had the opportunity, so I was like, heck yeah, I want to play again. Yeah, that's good. Honestly, yeah. I really support women's peon. I'm always joking about it. I support kids' peon. I, I'm always joking about it because the old guys, that's their man. It's always been oh, a man's yeah. game. But, you know, I think they're, they understand too, you know, like, you know, I think that we, I, for me, the reason why I say it is because, again, we got to talk about the changes in our culture. Right. We have to acknowledge that, yeah, this was a man's game at one point. But at the same time, you know, we should be encouraging it to move forward. I mean, women have been playing peon before I was ever born, before I came. Mm-hmm. Time period you're talking about, that's before me, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I started playing, it was because of women. You right. know, uh, my mom and my aunt, may she rest in peace, and and uh, their sister and uh, one of the nieces, they wanted to get a peon team together. So they all went down there, and my cousin John, you know, he was the only active player. He's a young guy at that mm-hmm. time. He was, I don't know, young 20s or something. And... Um, he had been playing uh, with uh, the old man out of Cocopa, uh, Cutawat, the late mm-hmm. um, Jose Robles, and uh, he was playing with him at the time. 
And so he was, all right, I'll, you know, I'll teach you guys. So he went and got the women together, and they're at the tribal hall, and they're there in chairs, going through the shots, and they were learning. They were going to have this great peon team. Right. And all of us kids were there listening to it. And I know I took an interest. I was like, hey, this is cool, you know. And my mom used to have her uncle's old sets, and she had players in her family, but it kind of missed a generation. Right. She never learned that. And uh, it was a man's thing at that time, like the girls sing and all that. And so anyways, what came out of that was, they never actually played a game. They just learned it and whatever. They had like four or five classes. But like um, my cousin who was there, and my other cousin, myself, we ended up learning how to play mm -hmm. by listening to them. And then we made our team, the first uh, ever uh, Viejas boys peon team. And then the girls that were there, they made their team, a girls mm -hmm. peon team. And then that's where peon started again in Viejas. We went from one player to like eight players. Mm -hmm. And we rocked it for, I mean, I was – barely a teenager at that time, you know, and been playing ever since, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm really thankful for that time. But but it was because women wanted to play that I started playing. Right, so I'm always right. joking around, oh, it's a man's game. We have those peon meetings here, you know, a couple years ago, and they all came in, and it was really cool to see the head peon and the elders rolling right, in, right. and they all said it, you know. They were like, it's it's an uh, old Indian game. You don't change it. It was a man's game, and, you know, but <laughs> – but, you know, they weren't down to nobody, but they were just saying, like, this is what it is. And to me, it was like almost like a meeting of the mafia, the five families, you know. Yeah, right. the leaders of the different areas rolling in, and they were like, this is what it is. And and I've been playing a long time, but I'm I'm a little kid to those guys. So I was just sort of yeah. quiet listening, like, that's cool, man. Yeah, I mean, as a woman, like, if that's the way the community or tribe feels and they don't want women to play, then we don't play. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'll respect it. Like I said, um, I just try to be realistic about things and yeah. try to be more supportive than putting each other down about being real overly critical about you sure. know, what we're doing. And I can see if what if we're changing things in a way that it it takes away from the essence or the spirituality of what we're doing, then yeah, you know, I'll support that too because we don't want to do that. But um, if it's something that's minimal and it's not impacting or changing, you know, the what we know and how things were, then. I'm fine with that too. I mean, I'm not excited about it, but I'll go back up my son. You know, what yeah, does it mean I'm yeah. not going to show up? Still enjoy being around it and singing the songs and being around the people. So it's it's a big deal, but not that big of a deal that's yeah. going to keep me from somewhere. It's good though. I, I yeah. like watching you guys play. I mean, I hold on. We <laughs> gotta go that far. No, I, I like I like when I mean, there's women's peon there. When it's just men's, I mean, it's cool too. But I find myself playing at tournaments when the women are playing and the kids are playing because mm -hmm. for me, I'm a family man, so I like to go when my kids have an opportunity to play, you know. And our whole crew will go, and the ladies, um, they'll go play, and, and it's just really like a real festive, and it's a good vibe, you know. I really right. enjoy that. I like that. And even like when they split it sometimes two nights, to me, it's not the same. I like when everyone's there the same mm -hmm. night. You can run into people, you know, they're there to play, and and um, you know, the women now. What I've noticed too in the last like four or five years, and I think your team might have really you know pioneered some of this recently is getting back on the knees on the ground to play right because for a long time women were just chairing it yeah and yeah. that was my thing was like hey you want to play a game let's play it the way it was started which is on the knees you know right not saying that every man plays on the knees because you know that don't happen either right. but but it's cool to see the younger ladies you know um your team is like for sure they're like now we're gonna play on our knees and we're gonna yeah, play yeah. on our bottoms and that's just what it is and yeah. so that's like mad respect on that you know because I don't feel like a lot of teams were doing that when you no, guys came in. A lot of teams weren't. And um, even sometimes now people want to get lazy about it, you know. And yeah. I told them all, hey, I'm a big girl if I can get on the ground. <laughs> and, and I'm older than you. <laughs> That's where I'm at with These it, elder so. knees will do it. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, nah, you got many years before you started, you know. Yeah. Your knees fall apart. <laughs> hey. But um, no, I, I honestly, I, I feel that. Um, I had my mom in here and she was talking about like, yeah, you know, men play on their knees and all this stuff. And I was like, because literally the week before I had played and it was like, I forgot, oh, I was running. I was trying to get in shape. My legs were just dead. And come midnight, like, you know, you know, they're like after the right. first game, everybody leaves. There's not a lot of people. So I was kind of like, <laughs> I sat in a chair a little bit and I try not to, I try to knee it, you know, and when I was younger, I could no pad, no nothing, just knee it. But right. I got a little heavier and, and I'm not old, but I, I don't know. My knees do not hold up like they used to. And yeah, I was like, I was in a chair after midnight, like literally. And then like oh, a few man. days later, she was in here talking about men are on their knees. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Oh man, I was embarrassed. But hey, we all have those moments, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hope that we keep teaching people that. And yeah. Even our, our girls and people don't don't get comfortable being in chairs and yeah keep it real. I know we had a um, Mike Burrell was out at the house a couple weekends ago sharing some of his songs and teaching us and he was telling us like um he really feels that 
us uh, being in the chairs takes away from the dancing and the movement yeah. and getting into it. And I totally believe it. You know, like I feel it. Yeah. You can totally feel it. Like when you're just sitting as opposed to being on your knees, dancing and moving and, you know, the whole endurance and getting the resurgence and strength. Yeah strength back when you're really in, in the moment so i feel that i've legit like in a chair start to get sleepy and want to go to sleep but when i'm on my knees i don't do that right. i'll stay up all night you know it's like uh if i'm singing too if i'm singing in a chair i'll get tired <laughs> but if i'm standing or if i'm up and you know like right. I, I won't i'll wake up it's like you, you just got to keep yourself going and stuff like that so there's a lot of stuff going on in indian country mm -hmm. um is there anything that is really standing out right now to you as you travel around, I should say, you travel yeah, yeah. all over. I think a um, couple big things that are standing out for me right now is um, just encouraging people to learn as much as they can about MMIW, you okay. know, murder and missing indigenous women and girls. And we see that it's not just women and girls, it's also men. Yeah. When we start focusing on the information, and unfortunately, there's not enough research or statistics available um, on the issue to really get a true picture and idea of what's occurring. I think there's 5,712 cases uh, cataloged in a database, but that by far and large is not even comprehensive. And so there's a lot of issues and challenges in terms of um, not having data collection or it not accurately reflecting the true numbers. But I think it's uh, really important at this stage in in our lives as uh, in the state of Native America really to learn as much as we can, empower ourselves and Know, be aware of those types of issues so i think you know for people to learn as much as they can about that to see what we can do to change that and uh, at the end of the day when i look at the issue like i keep telling everybody that the only thing that's going to change it is like that um you know racism mm -hmm. attitudes and mentalities about our people and our women and uh, in terms of wanting to conquer us and seeing us as exotic and that's not in a overly sexualized way that i'm saying that you know it's just yeah. like it's hard though because yeah. sometimes i do feel exotic hey <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I majestic have, I'm hey. To reach her or change my language because yeah, i'm like, so... gonna run with this, with this. <laughs> well, now that you mentioned it so majestic exotic and now no it's true though the yeah, over sexualization yeah. of our of our people that yeah. it, it, you know it goes back to that, you know, that old history of like the trappers and the, you know, frontier. Like, I want to buy me a squaw. It's like, right. man, we're not a commodity. We're people, you know, and we've right. got to do it. I think the thing about the whole MMIW, too, is like the idea of just having eyes on each other. Right. You know, I travel with my kids and, and our little group and and we have parents that go and adults and, and, and all the kids. I always tell them, like, keep eye on each other. You know, make sure you're OK. You know, make sure. If you, you know, travel in groups and pairs and, and as, as adults, we'll kind of stand around, especially at the peon fires when it's late. Right. And we kind of space ourselves out and we'll always have eyes on not just our kids, but everybody else's kids just to make sure that they're all safe, you know, and right. and don't be hanging out in the parking lot, hang out close, you know, and it, and it becomes like a very safe zone for the children and which is what is important. But I think even going to the, to the mall or going somewhere, you know, you see single mom with her kids just walking, you know, like. For me as a man, I kind of keep my eyes on that. And if I'd seen them getting attacked, I'm gonna—I I don't mean I know them, but I'm gonna probably try to intervene. Right. I would like to think that the the good part of me would be brave enough to intervene and say, "Hey, you know, not do that." Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had that experience, you know, to to know. But I I, I tell myself I will jump in, right. you know. And I think we got to do that. We got to be cognizant of our surroundings. We got to be a little vigilant and just look around. And if you see somebody going through it, you know, you see. A young man or, or a woman and they're they seem like they're they need help you know like reach out to the family and right. sometimes it's not the parents you might have to reach out to an aunt or a cousin and just say hey you check on your, your you know your young one they look like they're they're hanging around bad spots mm -hmm. or doing things they maybe shouldn't be doing or are they okay or you know and and being right. being willing to um sometimes you know take them on the bird trail you know take them on the powwow trail or take right. them to a conference or spend some time with some of the youth you know yeah. let them know that they're worth they're already enough yeah, I think you know. that's the big thing is empowerment. You know, yeah. trying to get to get us to see ourselves differently and that whole uh, crab in a bucket thing. I think that's yeah. I think that's one of the big issues in Indian country is that we don't see the worth in ourselves, so we can't see it in each other. Yeah, you know, and and I think that's what keeps us down. Like um, we don't recognize how capable we are, you know, and when we do see it, we don't trust it, you know. And mm -hmm. and I know myself as an educated person from my own tribe, like I've sat before my councils and they'll ask a question like, yeah, what I want to know is like, can we do this? And I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. And I'll explain why we can do something. They're like, yeah, we need to ask our attorneys. And I'm like, I'm sitting right here. I just told you we can do it. You know, <laughs> yeah. trusting me yeah. as a 
and it's you know different, every administration is different but to see that lack of trust you know in their own people like is, is not a good thing you know it's not good for either side for you know the leaders or the people uh, in the tribe and then the person that's educated and going through it like you go through what you go through to hopefully be a resource yeah and sometimes that's not always embraced but i think the more we can do to empower our youth and just even each other like i know i was posting about that recently like when you get an opportunity as a leader you know to do something like that's cool to see all your photos and things that you're able to do but bring somebody with you you yeah. know take somebody with you expose them give them that opportunity like that kind of like uh, enrichment changes people you know giving them the chance to do something that they would not otherwise be able to do but i think that's important like the mmyw and then also um ICWA, indian child welfare act yeah like there's so many things happening in indian country and and as just regular people indian people we're not doing enough to educate ourselves on the issues i think we're doing better but we're not doing enough you know to collectively work on the issues together like you know that whole unity and solidarity thing like I try to talk about that often because um, you know, early mentality was divide and conquer. And, and I'm not saying we're conquered people, but we were certainly put in a position where we had to negotiate and stipulate and agree to things we didn't want to agree to, mm -hmm. you know, to save ourselves as people like treaties, you know, and like a lot of people, um, Western society looks at indigenous people as being conquered. And it's like, no, the reality is we sat at the table and made an agreement. That's not being conquered. You know, that's making an agreement. Maybe we were pushed there and there were reasons we had to come to that conclusion. But by far and large, like, um, we're still very powerful people. You know, the sure. fact that we're still here after every effort of the most powerful government in the world trying to eradicate us from the face of the earth and the fact that we're still here and we're thriving and we're patriating culture and tradition which says a lot about who we are. And collectively, if we work together and we put aside our differences and you know, that whole lateral violence that is way too prevalent in Indian country would be that much further along, you know, because we definitely have uh, a survival, you know, will to live and to like be here as people. And we only come together when we have to sometimes. And I can't even imagine where we would be as a people if we did that uh, willfully when we don't just have to, but because we want to. Absolutely. That's what it's about, man. Got to come together and celebrate one another and enjoy it and uh and we shall remain right we're still right. here 500 years and 500 years we'll still be here rocking the house so That's right. i want to thank you again for being here and thank you. sharing some of your wisdom and your stories and all that kind of stuff and we'll see you down the bird trail somewhere right. claudette white live from the res thank you